When we developed our consumer model, we found a way of identifying consumer surplus for an individual consumer. We started with the consumer diagram, where we put the good X that we're interested in on the horizontal axis, and we put some composite good, dollars of other consumption, on the vertical axis. We then derived our budget constraint, where the slope of that budget constraint is just minus the price of the good on the horizontal axis, because the price of the good on the vertical axis is just equal to 1. We then found our optimal consumption bundle for the consumer, and that gave us our first point on a demand curve. It said that at this price, the consumer will demand this quantity of the good x. So on a lower picture, we kept x on the horizontal axis and put price on the vertical axis. So at that initial price, we saw that the consumer demands this quantity of x, and we got a point on the demand curve. We then said that we measure consumer surplus on marginal willingness to pay curves. And marginal willingness to pay curves are equal to compensated demand curves. So when we increase the price, say to this higher price, we imagine that we compensate the consumer to reach the original utility level, the original indifference curve. And so as the budget becomes steeper because we increase the price, we move the budget until it's tangent to that indifference curve, and we saw that pure substitution effect. So if we compensate the consumer, when the price increases to the new higher price, the consumer buys less, and we have a second point, and we can use those two points to draw out our compensated demand curve. And we call that compensated demand curve also the marginal willingness to pay curve. Given that the consumer is currently consuming at this point, this is the consumer's marginal willingness to pay curve that's derived from her current indifference curve. And then finally we said if this is the price and the consumer currently consumes here, we can see consumer surplus as the area above that price up to the marginal willingness to pay curve, this area here. But the problem is that marginal willingness to pay curves are not the same as regular demand curves. They're only the same as regular demand curves in one special case, and that is when tastes are quasi-linear in the good X. If tastes are quasi-linear in the good X, then when we take that compensation away and shift that budget in a parallel way, we're just removing income, and quasi-linear goods are goods that we consume the same quantity of as our income changes. So it wouldn't change how much we consume, and the point on the demand curve would be exactly the same point as the point on the compensated demand curve. So in this special case, the marginal willingness to pay curve is equal to the regular demand curve. If the good X were a normal good, then when we take that compensation away, there's an additional income effect. And so the actual consumption level at this higher price would lie to the left of where it is on the compensated demand curve. And the regular demand curve would be shallower. If, on the other hand, the good X was an inferior good, there'd be an income effect that pushes us in the opposite direction. That would place the point on the demand curve to the right of where the point on the compensated demand curve lies, and the regular demand curve would be steeper. But in that special case, the two curves are exactly identical, and so we can use the regular demand curve to measure consumer surplus, because it's the same as the marginal willingness to pay curve. So when we now go to the market picture, where we have a market demand curve that is simply the sum of all these individual demand curves, and we place a supply curve into the picture so we find our equilibrium price, if all the tastes are quasi-linear, then this demand curve is as if it arose from a single consumer with quasi-linear tastes. It's just the sum of a bunch of quasi-linear demand curves, which are equal to marginal willingness to pay curves. So in that case, the demand curve, the market demand curve, is an aggregate marginal willingness to pay curve. 
And so we can use exactly what we learned here to measure consumer surplus. It would be everything above that price up to the demand curve. So consumer surplus would be this area here because this demand curve is in fact interpretable as a marginal willingness to pay curve. Now in a previous economics class, you've probably drawn this picture. And what you implicitly assumed without saying it was that the underlying tastes are quasi-linear. That's what makes this picture correct. If, on the other hand, the underlying tastes weren't quasi-linear, the consumer surplus would look a little different. We'd still have an aggregate demand curve. That's the sum of all the regular demand curves. We'd still have a supply curve. The intersection of those would still give us the equilibrium price. But this could no longer be interpreted as an aggregate marginal willingness to pay curve. We saw that if the good X is a normal good for consumers, then the regular demand curve is shallower than the marginal willingness to pay curve. So if all the consumers had tastes that made good X a normal good, the market demand curve is shallower than the marginal willingness to pay curves. And if we added up all the actual marginal willingness to pay curves, they would be giving us an aggregate marginal willingness to pay curve that's steeper than that demand curve. And the correct way to measure consumer surplus would be along that aggregate marginal willingness to pay curve, just as it is in the consumer diagram. So if we use the regular demand curve to measure consumer surplus, we would be underestimating the actual consumer surplus. And of course, if X was an inferior good, the opposite would be true, because the marginal willingness to pay curves in that case would be shallower. And if we use the regular demand curve, we'd be overestimating the actual consumer surplus. The picture is obviously a lot simpler if we simply assume quasi-linear tastes for all the consumers. And many of the insights we get are actually very much the same if we use the more complicated picture. So oftentimes we'll simply assume that the underlying tastes are quasi-linear. That'll allow us to draw the simpler picture. <coughs> and the insights will still hold generally for the more complicated case. No reason to draw the more complicated case in that instance. In some cases, it'll make a difference, and we'll point out when that is. Now, there's one final <coughs> point we can make. If tastes are quasi-linear, <coughs> then it doesn't matter if we change the consumer's income. The demand curve will not change. It will not shift to the left or to the right. If the goods are normal, then an increase in income would shift the demand curve out. If the goods were inferior, it would shift it in. But if the goods are quasi-linear, then changing income doesn't shift the demand curves for individuals. So if we redistribute income between individuals and their tastes are quasi-linear in the good X, the individual demand curves wouldn't change, which would mean the market demand curve wouldn't change. So under the assumption of quasi-linear tastes, not only does this picture become simple, but the picture remains exactly identical, even if we redistribute income between people. That's not true in the more general case, because in the more general case, when we redistribute income, demand curves will shift around, and that will shift the market demand curves around, changing the equilibrium price. But again, in that special case, redistributing income between people does not actually shift the market demand curve because it doesn't shift individual demand curves and therefore it wouldn't change the market price.